This is uh, lecture two. Uh, I call it What is World History? Uh, I'm going to start here with a quote uh, from Henri Cordier, a, a French uh, teacher. He, he says, and this quote uh, kind of sets up the problems with world history, uh, at least for those in the West. He says, quote, Westerners have narrowed the history of the world into grouping what little they know about the expansion of the human race around the peoples of Israel, Greece, and Rome. They have thus ignored all those travelers and explorers who in their ships plowed the China Sea and the Indian Ocean or rode across the immensities of Central Asia to the Persian Gulf. In truth, the larger part of the globe, containing cultures different from those of the ancient Greeks and Romans, but no less civilized, these have remained unknown to those who write the history of their little world under the impression that they're writing world history. Uh, what this is is a critique, essentially, of uh, what we call uh, Eurocentrism. Uh, Eurocentrism is simply telling history from a distinctly Western or uh, European point of view. Uh, there's nothing wrong with this. Uh, we're raised in this culture, and uh, we do it without even thinking about it. What I want you to do is think about it. Uh, if you were raised in China, you'd tell history from a, a Sinocentric point of view. Uh, but we're, we are raised in the West, and we have a Eurocentric point of view. I'll give you an example of how this, uh, how this works. Uh, for instance, if you tell the story of Columbus, in the West we tell this story as one of great triumph, uh, one of um, uh, the decisive turning point in world history, uh, launching what today we call globalization, uh, the Columbian exchange, with the, uh, the exchange of domesticated plants and animals and technologies and religions and cultures and diseases. Uh, Columbus sort of launches us into this modern era and it's depicted as a great success, a great triumph. Now, uh, that's the Eurocentric point of view. Look at Columbus from the point of view of the Caribbean Indians in 1492, and you get something quite different. Uh, you get literally the end of the world. Uh, within a couple of generations, these people are wiped out uh, by the, uh, the diseases, the pathogens brought over by the Europeans. Uh, the Indians, of course, have no immunity to these diseases, and they are quickly decimated. So the Eurocentric point of view gives us a story of great triumph. Uh, if you take the point of view of the natives, uh, you literally have the apocalypse. It's, it's the end of the world. So what I want you to do is simply keep this in mind as you uh, listen to these lectures and go through the other course materials. Always be aware that everything has a point of view. Now. I'm going to mention some major sources that I've used uh, to put these lectures together. Um, world history was one of my major fields in graduate school, so I've spent a lot of time sitting around seminar tables with professors and other students talking about these books and these arguments. I've also used uh, the McNeil's uh, book called The, uh, the Human Web, uh, A Bird's Eye View of World History. Uh, this is a very accessible uh, uh, text on world history. It's very readable. Uh, it gives you the broad strokes that we like to use in world history, but it has enough detail uh, to keep you interested. I've also used um, Professor Peter Stearns, his lectures through the Great Courses series. Uh, his lectures on world history have been very helpful uh, in, uh, in chronology and some other key terms and concepts. You're probably aware that we teach uh, a number of different uh, history surveys. Uh, the most common, of course, for you guys is the, is the U.S. history survey. And then, of course, we teach Western civilization, which is focused on Europe, uh, the Eurocentric point of view, and now world history. Now, I want to emphasize that world history is a fairly recent development in the profession. It's now offered at many colleges and universities. Uh, the World History Journal was uh, started in the early 1990s. Uh, Jerry Bentley, the uh, editor. Uh, world History is a major field in uh, various PhD programs like mine. Uh, it's increasingly uh, a pertinent topic in popular culture. 
I'm thinking now of the, uh, of the book uh, Guns, Germs, and Steel by Jared Diamond, a very popular book um, and turned into a, a PBS uh, documentary, which was also quite interesting. Where did world history come from? In the 1960s, the historical profession became in increasingly fragmented or uh, specialized. Uh, we began to tell stories that had previously been ignored. Uh, previously, political history, uh, military history had dominated the profession. But now we have the rise of what was called social history. This is sort of history from the, from the bottom up. Uh, we begin looking at uh, la the, uh, the laboring class, the working class. Uh, key text here is E.P. Thompson's Making of the English Working Class. This came out in 1964. Um, so social history uh, uh, sort of ignores the elites, which had always been the focus of history, and begin looking at the, uh, the common people. Uh, we have the emergence of an African-American history where we re-examine slavery from the slaves' point of view. We re-examine Reconstruction and, uh, and the Civil Rights Movement uh, from the point of view of those involved in the movement. And then, of course, in the 80s and 90s, there's an emerging sort of cultural turn, as they call it, and we have gender history. Uh, quite often, this is confused with women's history, and uh, it shouldn't be. Uh, gender history refers to masculinity and femininity and how these <coughs> concepts are used uh, in history. And this is sort of the emergence of um, or the continuation of social history, uh, getting away from a focus on the elite. Uh, cultural history emerges uh, here in the 1990s, investigating the meaning of things. Uh, cultural history tends to reject what we call meta narratives. Uh, these sort of all explanatory systems like uh, Christianity or Marxism. Uh, there's a focus on language. Uh, where does power lie in a society? So world history is uh, sort of born of these increasing, uh, this increasing fragmentation in the profession. Uh, historians looking for larger units of analysis, for instance, uh, from a national history to regional history, to a bigger unit of analysis, world history. There are objections to world history. I'll mention a few of them here. This is a controversial topic at times. Uh, the, main, the main objection is probably that world history encroaches or takes away from Western civilization. Uh, world history is accused of being too diverse, too uh, multicultural, uh, especially here in the United States. Uh, we view ourselves as part of the Western tradition, and uh, to do world history tends to diminish the role of the United States and shift the focus to other places. And uh, a lot of people have uh, trouble with that. Uh, some people think of history as a tool for nationalism. That is, the historian's job is to exalt uh, the nation's past uh, so that we can justify our present and uh, perhaps our future. Uh, most historians would disagree and say, no, they are not a tool of the state and they're not here to simply uh, praise uh, the history of the state as they are to examine it critically. Uh, I'm going to mention a couple of uh, approaches uh, to world history. How do we get at such a big topic? There is the civilizational approach uh, where you look at civilization side by side, compare them in similar time periods. Uh, a key term here that's, that's useful is cross-cultural encounters. We find in the past missionaries and merchants, uh, conquerors, travelers, who uh, venture into strange lands and they take information with them and they pick up new information. Technologies are exchanged, uh, domesticated plants and animals and uh, diseases, uh, religions. Cross-cultural encounters, this is a key way of uh, linking human society together. Uh, world history also has in it uh, non-human factors. I'll mention a few uh, examples of this. Disease. Uh, disease obviously plays a huge role in human history. You think of the great pandemics of the past. Uh, of course, we have the Black Death or the bubonic plague in the 14th century which ravaged Eurasia with a huge uh, loss of population. 
Uh, we've already mentioned the decimation of the indigenous people of the New World after Columbus arrives in 1492. Um, of course, we have the Great Spanish Flu at the end of the Great War in 1917 and 18. So disease is a, a theme or a factor in world history. Uh, trade is another. Again, we've all heard of the Silk Roads that link uh, China to the Roman Empire. Uh, of course, the great Mongol circuit of trade in the 14th century uh, that tends to tie Eurasia together. Um, you could track uh, the expansion of the market or capitalism, the world system that draws more and more nations into it. Uh, immigration is another factor in world history. Uh, people seeking opportunities, moving to um, uh, better places. Uh, people forced, forced immigration, like slavery, for instance. There's over 11 million Africans that are forced uh, to the New World to, to labor in slavery. Of course, people fleeing uh, danger as well. You see a lot of uh, mass population movements, uh, say, at the end of uh, the Second World War. So immigration is a theme that will reemerge. Technology is another theme. Uh, you can go all the way back to the, uh, the sort of cliched Stone Age to Bronze Age to Iron Age as weapons and tools become increasingly more sophisticated. Um, you can track it all the way to the present uh, with the invention of paper, uh, the printing press, the computer. Uh, technology has a way of shrinking the world, uh, making um, globalization possible and making the earth a much smaller place. Uh, climate is another factor. Um, of course, we had a little ice age in the, what, the 14th century, uh, which caused famine, which caused uh, massive population loss. Uh, we have sea changing levels uh, in history. We have, um, even today, we uh, talk about climate change. This is a very politicized issue, and I don't want to get into it here. Uh, but climate is something that world historians take note of. So when we talk about approaches to world history, we're looking uh, for patterns, broad patterns, connections, and linkages. Uh, some key terms and concepts uh, that will be useful for you. Diffusion uh, is the first. Uh, this is simply the spread or the dissemination of information and its adoption um, as one civilization encounters another, or agents from these civilizations encounter each other. Uh, traditions and Encounters. This, of course, is the title of uh, Jerry Bentley's very popular world history textbook. And Traditions and Encounters um, points to those things that historians like to track. Uh, continuity and then sudden change. Continuity, change. Uh, key terms here to keep in mind. Uh, determinism or human agency. Human agency refers to the impact of uh, a particular person on history. Uh, you can think of someone like uh, Muhammad, for instance, or, uh, or Jesus, or Napoleon, or Hitler. Uh, determinism refers to those broader, bigger structural uh, factors in human life, whether it's trade or technology or disease. Uh, Determinism tends to negate the individual human and uh, stress the larger, uh, broader patterns. Uh, the world system, uh, this is going to come up again. In fact, in fact, we'll have a little lecture on it. I'm just going to introduce it here. This is Emmanuel Wallerstein's uh, analysis whereby uh, he points out that there's a core of the world system, uh, those highly developed, uh, capitalized countries. Uh, there's a semi-periphery and then a periphery. As you move out from the core towards the periphery, you have lesser developed nations, nations with cheap labor and raw materials that are exploited by the core. And again, we'll talk about this in more detail later. Um, I want to say just a word here about uh, the fact that world history is an interdisciplinary uh, study. By interdisciplinary, I mean the historian is going to have to venture outside of his profession and use other specialists uh, to make sense of world history. Uh, for instance, biology with the study of disease. We've already talked about pandemics and the Black Death and uh, smallpox and malaria. Uh, we use botany. Uh, think of um, uh, dendrochronology, whereby we can date 
uh, trees, uh, through the tree ring growth, you can, as you cut through a tree, you can see this. You've undoubtedly seen it yourself. Uh, this is useful because we can actually look back in the past with these tree rings and we can determine something about the climate in this time period, whether there are forest fires or insect infestation or extreme cold or drought. Uh, you can measure or get some idea about the past climate through tree rings. Of course, geology, uh, we look at plate tectonics, we look at uh, climate formation of the earth when we talk about the origins of man. Uh, we bring in linguistics um, to look at the spread of human languages, to see uh, commonalities in languages. Uh, we'll talk about this uh, in another lecture. Uh, we use archaeology, obviously, uh, to give us clues uh, to prehistory and to, and to antiquity. Uh, literary criticism is now a tool used by historians uh, to sort of pick apart or deconstruct texts. Uh, you see this used in uh, a lot of classic texts. Even, even the Bible is uh, under scrutiny by literary critics. And of course we use demography, uh, whereby we bring statistical analysis. Uh, you see this used in, uh, in uh, immigration, for instance. So, some conclusions here. Uh, world history takes a long view. Uh, world history looks for patterns, links, uh, connections. Uh, among peoples. Uh, world history uses comparative method. Uh, world history is interdisciplinary. Uh, world history allows us a broader view of the human species. And world history, like I just mentioned, takes note of non-human agents. So that wraps up this first uh, lecture as an introduction uh, to this topic. Thank you.